The Exxon Radio Show with Rob McConnell is largely an opinion talk show. All opinions, comments, or statements of fact expressed by Rob McConnell's guests are strictly their own and are not to be construed as those of the Exxon Radio Show or endorsed in any manner by Rob McConnell, Relmar McConnell Media Company, the Exxon Broadcast Network, its affiliated networks, stations, employees, or advertisers. All hit radio. Welcome to the X Zone, a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. Now, here's your host, Rob McConnell. And welcome back to the Exxon, everyone. I am Rob McConnell, and for the next four hours, I'm your host and your guide as together we cross the time-space continuum to this place that I call the Exxon. It's a place where people dare to believe and dare to be heard. It's a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. The Exxon comes to you Monday through Friday from 10 p.m. Eastern until 2 a.m. Eastern right here on the Exxon Broadcast Network, Talkstar Radio Network, Mutual Broadcast Network, and iHeartRadio. If you'd like to send an email, exxon at exxonradiotv.com. On all social media sites, TV, And to find out about the latest programming we have available for you, 24-7, 365 on the Exxon Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. My guest this hour, Exxon Nation, is Darren Spencer. And we're going to be talking to Darren about humane policing. And uh, first of all, Darren, welcome to the Exxon. Thanks for having me on, Rob. Tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, how you decided or why you decided to go into policing. Well, I uh, grew up in Texas, Mm -hmm. and I joined the Marine Corps at a young age. And after that, I went into the State Department and moved out to Colorado and joined the law enforcement. Um, And the reason is the uh, sense of duty I felt when in the Marines, and Mm -hmm. I always enjoyed giving back to my community. Uh, What is humane policing? Humane policing is an individualistic approach to law enforcement where I teach people to relate to the individuals they're serving so that they can gain cooperation instead of forcing compliance. Now, do you do this with the community? Do you do this with those who are incarcerated? Do you do this with law enforcement officers? Who do you do this with? All of the above. I uh, work with corrections officers. I work with uh, law enforcement agencies, both uh, police departments and sheriff's Mm -hmm. office. And I also educate the general public on how and why law enforcement takes specific actions that they do. Can you give us some examples of humane policing in action? Sure. Um, When I would respond to like a domestic violence call, Mm -hmm. I would actually go against my agency's um, typical training policy of whenever you knew you were going to arrest somebody that they would teach to put them in handcuffs as soon as possible. Sure. And I adamantly disagreed with that. Why? Um, Because the, they would say it was for officer safety purposes. Mm -hmm. And I would say it's my call. I'm responsible for it. And if I feel like it is appropriate for me to put them in handcuffs, I will. But uh, uh, yeah, but as a fellow, as a police officer myself, you follow a protocol. And policies and procedures of the department that you're working for. So, why, you know, how come you went against policy procedure? Because I didn't agree with the specific policy okay. of the blanket statement of as soon as you knew you're going to arrest somebody, mm-hmm. you need to immediately put them in handcuffs. And I could articulate why. Well, please do. And and so the reason is mm-hmm. I wanted to get a more beneficial outcome. And so when I'm in somebody's house and they're agitated with their spouse or having money issues, whatever the problem may be, they're having a bad day Yeah, because I'm in their house. And so I could force the situation and immediately put them in handcuffs and further escalate it. But what I chose to do is I would always give the people options. And I would say, here's the deal. You can cooperate with me. I'll let you say bye to your spouse. You can Mm -hmm. hug your kids and we can go out to my car and I can take custody of you there. Or you can choose to not cooperate and you'll get additional charges, and you'll further traumatize your family. 
because, and whenever I'd give them that option, they'd always take the first option. And the reason is they didn't care what I thought of them, Mm -hmm. but almost everybody cares what their kids think of them. And because of that, they would always thank me and apologize for their initial reaction to me. But they would also have a little more faith in law enforcement and appreciate my approach and what I did. What happens if they had no children? Well, then I could still talk to them about um, their spouse and further escalate the situation. And Mm -hmm. the more you give people options, they, whenever they're not, um, when their mental capacity is not hindered by a disability or they're not under the influence of drugs or alcohol, you can usually reason with people. Right. And, and people usually understand when they did something wrong. And so the big complaint most people have with law enforcement isn't that they're being arrested. It's how they are arrested. And, and that is a distinct difference. But when you arrest somebody, you take away all their rights. They have no more rights. Except, uh, you know, the right to call a lawyer, they have the right to remain silent. So I don't, you know, like I, like I said, I was in law enforcement myself many years. And no matter what the case was, when you arrested somebody, they weren't very happy. That's correct. Um, but you, there can be a, I'm not sure how it was in Canada, but mm-hmm. we typically deal with the same people over and over. And when a individual had a negative interaction with law enforcement, mm-hmm. The next time they dealt with law enforcement, it was typically worse. And when I showed that little bit of compassion and restraint and understanding of their situation, the next time I saw them, they were more cooperative. They were more appreciative. And it's like, yeah, I screwed up. And they would be very forthcoming with all the information and make my job easier. So in your, your opinion, what are some of the major problems facing law enforcement today? Um, there's several, um, the national media is pushing a negative tone for law enforcement, giving a jaded perception of law enforcement to the general public and law enforcement as a professional entity, our warrior mentality training is one of the biggest problems we're having. And I wrote an article of it on Mm humanepolicing.com, uh, law enforcement's mindset, doing more harm than good. Because they teach every encounter you have, that person's going to kill you or try to. Where, in case in point, it's just not even close to the fact. Because I ran the math on it with 750,000 sworn officers in the U.S. And what it breaks down to is one in 3.1 million interactions becomes tragic for law enforcement. But all and. Like- Go ahead. But all it takes is that one, and you've got a lo- the loss of a law enforcement officer's life. Yeah. Um, that is a possibility. And I'm not saying officers should be lackadaisical or complacent, mm-hmm. but I'm, not, I'm just saying they shouldn't go amped up into a situation where they expect somebody to try and take their life, because that's not the case. And I equate it to the general public of, let's say, everybody's familiar with driving a car. Mm-hmm. And they're driving to work. And if everybody was on edge like they thought they were going to die in that commute to work, imagine the stress and frustration that would go over into the workplace and into their home life. And people would just be basket case. Well, I personally, I think there's a big difference between somebody driving to work and an officer responding to a code three. Yeah, well, the. According to the National Safety Council, your lifetime odds of dying in a motor vehicle crash are 1 in 114. But have these people who are on the National Safety Council ever carried a gun and a badge, which is a target? I I understand that, but I'm just talking about the specific numbers. Less than 200 officers tragically die each year. And a good portion of those are due to auto accidents or while they're doing traffic stops being hit by other motorists. So the number of actual one-on-one interactions becoming lethal for that officer is actually much less likely. But could it be because the public understands what the, what the consequences of any actions they might take about the police officer keep them in check? And if these options weren't maintained and these actions weren't maintained and the training policy and procedures were not maintained, that the public would have a different perception of the police. Uh, I 
I don't think they would. And my experience, um, one of my talk about in humane policing, how perspectives can influence our performance. Mm -hmm. uh, a lady's going off on me. She's got her cell phone a couple feet away from my face. She's trying to get a reaction out of me. And because that is the current environment and perception people have of law enforcement. And so it really can't get much worse than it is currently. And the other question I would pose to you, which I believe to be the case, mm -hmm. is with our assertion and with us backing people into corners, how many situations are we unnecessarily escalating? You know, my years of policing, I can't think of one. Well, I, I talk about several situations where um, we have what's called officer-induced jeopardy, where we force a situation where we necessarily don't need to. All right, and stand, a negative outcome becomes that. Stand by. We've got to take our break at the bottom of the hour. I'm sorry, our first break here. Exonation Darren Spencer is our guest, www.humanepolicing.com. That's www.humanepolicing.com. And we'll be back after this commercial break as we continue here in the Exxon from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, on the Exxon Broadcast Network, Talkstar Radio Network, Mutual Broadcast Network, and iHeartRadio. Don't go away. Darren Spencer is our special guest of this hour, Exonation, and we're talking to Darren about humane policing. His website is humanepolicing.com. You know, you made a statement earlier about how the media is giving a negative spin towards police officers and law enforcement. Is it possible that the media, that the media is just reacting to public outcry? Um, I was, I'm working on a, another article for the Sacramento shooting in the Colorado, um, the California police officer fatal involved shootings as well mm -hmm. to address those situations where the media seems to gleam on to racially motivated, um, incidents and stream it as that is the case that happens all the time. When you look at the numbers, it's just not the case. And they always talk about the negative outcomes of situations, and there's very little media coverage of the good that law enforcement does on a day-in and day-out basis. And you may see a handful of cases over a six-month period of time that's mm -hmm. negative where these 750,000 sworn officers have interactions with people on a daily basis that turns out good. I, I understand that, and I can appreciate that. However, going looking back over the years, you didn't, uh, you know, criminals have the the heaviest uh, firepower, and the police have the least. You know, what do you have? A Glock. I remember uh -huh. when I was in the force. You know, we were trained with a thirty eight Smith and Wesson, and then we went up Colt Pythons. You know, and you know, when you had a thirty eight Smith and Wesson, the bullets would just bounce off the windshield of the vehicle that you were engaging in. The you know, bad guys always had better weaponry than the cops. That's uh, not the case in the U.S. Um, I carried a Glock 21, mm -hmm. and I had at my disposal an AR-15, um, a shotgun, yep, lethal so and yeah. non-lethal, mm -hmm. and um, taser, pepper spray. I had yep. a plethora of options available to me. All right, so when we see the events that some people may say are racially motivated— where law enforcement is put under the scrutiny of the media, which puts the scrutiny of the law enforcement agency under the scrutiny of John Q. Public. You know, I, I think one of the biggest uh, times that people will remember this is during the Rodney King riots and what happened there. That You know, it's hard to say that wasn't uh, racially motivated. And I agree, and we've made drastic strides since Rodney King. Mm -hmm. um, but the media seems to think that the situation is actually getting worse. And uh, a quote from my book, uh, 
in law enforcement, you don't know how much impact you've had because you can't know of all the possible horrors you've prevented. By contrast, the ones we don't prevent are glaringly obvious. And that's why law enforcement is a thankless profession. And the U.S. is facing a crisis in, in law enforcement. Not only are we having negative perceptions of mm -hmm. our um, citizens and the interactions are getting worse, we're having hiring issues, retaining issues, and recruiting issues. And so back in 2004, when I was certified, there was 100 viable applicants to one good position. And now agencies are having trouble filling open spots with qualified individuals. And when you have that issue, your quality of officer is naturally going to drop, making our problem worse as far as the level of officer than how it was before. Why do you think that's the case? Why do you think there are so many vacancies and not enough law enforcement applicants? Because primarily the public perception of law enforcement. And you have seasoned veterans, 5, 10, 15-year vets, mm -hmm. saying enough's enough. I'm not making a difference. Nobody likes me, and I don't know why I'm taking these liabilities and risks for myself and my family. And so they're finding another profession. Sounds like and, a, It sounds like a pity party by these guys instead of the actions and the reactions of growing up professionals. Well, when you can get paid more to do something that uh, will benefit you and your family, you know, law enforcement's a calling. And, you You're know, right, law yeah. enforcement's got a very high burnout rate of about seven years in the States. And when you have these experienced officers getting out, it takes our average experience and drops it down drastically. And you've got younger, inexperienced officers trying to respond to situations where they don't have adequate ex life experiences or training to incorporate into it to get a better outcome. Jeez, and they're forced to force compliance instead of gain the cooperation they need to. Sounds like the armed forces. Well, our armed forces actually, um, like I said, I was a Marine. Mm -hmm. And in the mid-90s, um, intelligent and articulate, and people would ask me, like, well, why are you a Marine? You could do so many other things. And there was that disconnect of sense of duty and sense of country to the general public. But if you fast forward today, post 9-11, Regardless of somebody's political view, you know, they are appreciative of that individual service member. And so our military is actually doing better on a morale standpoint than our law enforcement is now, or it used to be the opposite. So why don't we get rid of the police forces and bring in the military then? Well, um, I forget who said the quote, but they said, yeah, I can make you safe as long as I take away your rights. And... And which rights would the military enacting in the in the aspect of federal law enforcement be taking away anybody's rights? It goes against our uh, institution, uh, our constitution, um, on putting um, armed forces on the ground in the U.S. for safeguarding purposes outside of emergencies and national guard premise. But if and, if law enforcement is such in the the shape that you're describing, maybe we should consider changing the law and enacting the military to take over private policing. The, that would cause so much more unrest and distrust within our country toward our government than we already have. And it would take the U.S. into anarchy. Why? As long as you're being protected, who cares who does the protecting? My gosh, shopping centers hire security guards. You know, uh, look at Wackenhut. They do security for the government. What about the privatization I'm, of prisons? That's the government's I, job, and, and yet nothing's, you know, it's not a big deal. So why not put the guys in uniform who are being paid anyway, put them on patrol and take the police officers who don't want to do their job anymore because they can't take the pressure and let them go into bigger and better things? It's a win-win situation as I see it. I, I understand your point, um, mm -hmm. but I adamantly disagree. And as Aristotle said, it's the mark of an educated mind to be able to entertain a thought without accepting it. But Aristotle wasn't in our time. He was in a much different time. It's just like the, the forefathers who, 
who you know went into the Second Amendment, the right to bear arms. They didn't know that people would be walking around with AK-47 and and automatic weapons with butts on them and with the firepower that they have today. If they had known this back then, would they have still said everyone's got the right to bear arms? I don't think so. I, I don't know what they um, would have said with mm-hmm. that knowledge, but they also talk about in the Second Amendment the ability to... Um, bear arms even against your government if it becomes oppressive and that is the one of the number one issues we're facing right now so if you and don't if you don't a like, lot of i'm sorry go ahead. no no go ahead i'm sorry i thought you were, i'll wait and a lot of states are considering mm-hmm. um banning assault weapons currently um or assault style weapons we did it back in the mid 90s mm-hmm. um and gun makers just um skirted the Uh, checkpoints to make a rifle an assault weapon whether it be eliminate a bayonet stud or uh, change the magazine or change the component where it would not then fall into that classification and yet the criminals don't have to do anything they just have to keep breaking the law and it seems that you know they can get away with murder basically because they don't have to follow the rules and regulations and yet don't they have the right to bear arms? Um, no. Why not? Criminals don't. Well, so they just, lo- lose that right when they become felons. But what happens until the person is arrested, charged, and convicted? He has that right. That's so correct. how so and, how can there so how can there be a two two tier system two tier standard here? So in uh, humane policing, how perspectives influence our performance mm-hmm. in Chapter Nine: Stopping the Growing Trend. Uh, One of the subchapters is bad guys don't get background checks. And I'm talking about how the Hells Angels uh, motorcycle gang Mm -hmm. skirted um, gun laws by having a dealer, essentially, who could justifiably buy firearms and then sell them to them. So the criminal element, for the most part, does not use the background check system, which is why it's so flawed. Well, Um, neither, neither do people who go to gun shows. Right. Um, no, gun shows do require background checks depending on the type of weapon. Um, like if um, not all weapons require the background checks depending on the state, but but most do um, for all handguns and then other type weapons. So as a police officer, how, how did you manage by bi- there being so many different jurisdictional laws that you had to be aware of? You know, here in Canada, we've got the Criminal Code of Canada. That's it. Bang. Mm hmm. Well, I only had, uh, I was a sworn officer in the uh, state of Colorado, Mm -hmm. so I had to be familiar with Colorado laws. So I didn't, until after I started this endeavor, become Mm -hmm. more familiar with other states' laws. I I understand that. But what I'm saying is that here in Canada, we have one federal law that covers all provinces. The law doesn't change from province to province. It's the same law. Mm-hmm. You know, if it's a, if it's guns, if it's a, any criminal act or something that you guys would call a felony, uh, anything to do with guns, it's narcotics, Food and Drug Act, it's all under federal jurisdiction. The province has no business in it. It's under federal. Yeah. So as a police officer, you had municipal laws, you had provincial laws, and then you had federal laws. We've got to take a break. This is the Exxon. I am Rob McConnell. Darren Spencer is my guest, and uh, his website is humanepolicing.com. We'll both be back on the other side of this break. Don't go away. Darren Spencer is my special guest of this hour, Exxon Nation. We're talking about uh, Darren's book, Humane Policing. His website is www.humanepolicing.com. Um, are you still in law enforcement, Darren? I became uh, disabled three years ago, which I'm still working through that medical issue, which oh. is why I took the time since I was laid up in the bed to write the book about mm-hmm. my experiences. And I hope to return to the profession as soon as I get healthy. Okay, so... Uh, the, now that you've had time away and you're looking outside of the box, so to speak, 
How do you think that we can better bridge the divide between law enforcement and the communities that different law enforcement agencies uh, serve? Well, we got to do it by retraining law enforcement to how and why they do things, because we are the professional in that chaotic situation. We should be the calm in the storm. And we also need to educate the public so they understand how and why, so they can, when something does happen, they can relate to it. So I encourage citizens to do ride-alongs with their local agencies and to get a better understanding of what law enforcement actually is instead of seeing the 30-second clip on uh, social media or just the headlines that they Mm -hmm. see in the national media. So how do you think that we should handle the problem of the the availability instantaneously that John Q. Public has when they see something that they believe to be police brutality, excessive force? And that's where the education comes in. And um, I'm a big proponent of body cams and transparency because the more trust and respect we have as an institution Mm – the more leniency will be given um, by the public when they see something that doesn't quite look right. But how can we say by, by law enforcement wearing body cameras that this is instilling uh, trust and faith? Well, when they see, um, like in Denver, Chief White makes all body camera footage available to the general public. Mm-hmm. Um, so anybody can access that as, as long as they follow the right request. Um, the body cams do show incidents with where um, it's a negative outcome, and that's what the media and the public seems to latch on to. And the more we have those situations, um, the more we can explain and talk through it, and that's where we can promote positive change and interaction for both the citizen and the general public, the citizen and law enforcement, so that they can move forward um, to something better. But if the citizens see something wrong, don't they have the right to report it and to get it out to the social media groups as well as to the mainstream media? Yeah, absolutely. That's our freedom of press. Mm -hmm. But a member of John Q public isn't a member of the media. No, he's not. But, um, every person still has the freedom of speech Mm -hmm. and that is covered under that. And it's the when the peaceful assemblies become non-peaceful, that's where we have the issue. That's where the riots occur. That's where it becomes a constitutional right to breaking the law. And that's what people need to understand the difference and how to promote positive change versus making the situation worse. So what differentiates between a peaceful assembly and breaking the law where it goes from peaceful assembly to... Uh, a violation of the ordinances or the local, state, or federal laws? It would be impeding somebody else's rights, um, destruction of property, Mm -hmm. um, hindering a government where the government can't function, um, shutting down roadways. Gotcha. Um, And with peaceful assembly, you have to request for a permit for that. It has to be applied for. But if somebody has the right to assembly... Why should they have to apply for a permit if it's their right? It is their right, but there's guidelines in place to exercise that right. Well, it kind of seems redundant if somebody has the right to assemble, and then you say, well, you, don't, you can't assemble because you don't have a permit. That there makes it look to somebody on the outside that, hey, wait a minute, this is a two-tier system. You've got the right, but you can't unless you have the permit. Well, so, so, like... Um, when Stefan Clark was killed in Sacramento, um, people assembled in front of the um, King Stadium and they shut down the doors. Mm-hmm. That was a peaceful assembly. It was essentially on private property. But when you have a peaceful assembly starting to block roadways and stuff like that, the government needs time to set up barriers to divert things because it is impeding other things. And that's why the permitting in, is in place for bigger type protests slash marches. I see. So in your opinion, is the policing getting better or is it getting worse? 
it depends on the actual agencies. Some agencies are much more progressive than others. Um, but we still have a problem as a whole when a tragic incident occurs. Most uh, gut instincts and reactions of the chief of police or the sheriffs or mm -hmm. the mayors, they want to return to the status quo where they should take that public outcry as an opportunity to change their city and change their law enforcement agencies for something better. Because everybody, if you talk to any chief, any sheriff, there will be things he would like to change about his agency, whether it require money or funding or um, any other type like personnel. You know, that is the time to do it was when you have that public outcry and they're more accepting of, yeah, OK, we get it. We screwed up. And this is how we can not screw up in the future and do better. But it's going to take X, Y and Z. On February the 14th, you had the shooting at the school in Florida. For a couple of weeks, it was headline news. You had all these people doing all these protests. You had the activists. You had the kids. You had the parents. You had everybody out there. All of a sudden, dead issue. And yet when we look back, you know, you've got Columbine, you've got Colorado, and you've got the other school shootings. How come nothing really changes? Um, actually, things have changed, and they've changed to the worse as far as the mass shootings. And the reason I believe things have gotten worse mm -hmm. is because of the amount of notoriety we give to the shooters in the media. And I don't think they should mention the person's name, put up their picture, mm -hmm. because they get more press coverage than the MVP of the Super Bowl. Well, you know, and I, I, other I, people gleam onto that. Well, sure. So did many of the students. From the uh, from the school in Florida, they're gleaming like crazy. You know, they're out there and they're getting their fifteen twenty minutes of, of fame, and they're going on the different talk shows. You know, so I understand where you're coming from, but looking at the big picture, people are still getting guns illegally. People are still getting killed. Nothing Most is changing, and people look to law enforcement and say, "What the hell's going on, guys? Why aren't you there to protect us?" Um, the um, Florida shooting was an anomaly on how law enforcement responded. We've had uh, three, three attempted or quasi-attempted mm -hmm. school shootings since then across the U.S. that were thwarted within a minute. And I think in all three cases, uh, one, there was injuries in all three cases, but the shooter was eliminated. Um, and that's how it's supposed to respond to the training yeah. on law enforcement side of responding to an active shooter is pretty good across the nation. Well, I'll take my um, head off to the uh, to the Baltimore Police Department. They did a fantastic job. Mm -hmm. You know, and and then we had that lady who went into wh wh where was it YouTube because yeah, YouTube she was she was upset because they were taking down her videos or, or doing something. And got lot, the, you've got a lot of lunatics out there. And the interesting thing about um, mass shootings is the vast majority of them get their guns legally. Mm -hmm. And so that's why the kids are advocating um, changes to gun laws where um, your criminal element um, doesn't utilize the background check system. And so that's where the changes are trying to be implemented. In fact, Florida has already made changes to their gun law and ages to get, get guns. So, the outcry of the students has been successful in that regard. Up here in Canada, we've got gun control. We've got very, 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 very few shootings. We don't mm -hmm. need guns in order to prove our manhood or how, how uh, politically correct or incorrect we are. We've got common sense. And, I, you know, even our policing up here is totally different. You know, we're not paramilitary units. We're police officers. So mm -hmm. there's a vast difference, and man, I'll tell you something. I'm glad we've got gun gun control, and why anybody would not want to go through an extensive background check to me is a red flag. Yeah, I agree with that. I'm a yeah. gun owner, and I've got no problem going through a background check every time I buy a gun. Sure. And guns don't. People always equate guns to killings, but London has almost no guns, mm -hmm. and their homicide rate is higher than New York City. And so that tells you that it's not just about guns, it's about people. But people like to latch on to guns because um, they are used in these mass shootings where it gets more coverage. 
So do you really see the right to carry guns if you're not a police officer? Yeah, I do. Why? Because you see a lot of incidents that are actually stopped by private citizens carrying guns. And I've got no problem car- people carrying guns mm-hmm. as long as they can show – because what I would like to see added to people purchasing guns, mm-hmm. one, that they are trained on how to use it. Two, they have a means to properly store and secure the weapon because a lot of our um, accidents occur – primarily due to unsecured firearms, and that's how firearms also get stolen Mm -hmm. for the criminal element. So I've got no problem with the citizen who, the good citizen, that wants to um, carry a firearm responsibly. I've got no issues with that. Man, are we ever different there. We'll be back on the other side of this commercial break as we wrap up this hour with our guest, Darren Spencer. His website is humanepolicing.com. I'm Rob McConnell. This is the Exxon. We're coming to you from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Spencer's our guest. His website is humanepolicing.com. Darren, let's, let me give you a hypothetical situation. You go to bed tonight. You're Darren Spencer. You're recovering for a, for a medical condition. And I hope that everything goes well with you and that one day you get back on patrol because I love your dedication. I love your, your drive. You wake up tomorrow morning. You are the, let me see, the Attorney General of the United States. You're the number one cop. What changes would you make across the board as the new chief cop? I would change the emphasis of law enforcement from a primary of enforcing laws Mm -hmm. to be more like Canada as far as peace officers, because that's how almost every state categorizes law enforcement. We need to maintain the peace Mm -hmm. and we need to control the interactions with people instead of forcing compliance. Because the more we do an us versus them mentality, um, that's what drives the hate and creates this divide where everybody's hostile. Because peace officers are public servants and we're there to serve and protect the people that are yelling and cussing and being disrespectful to us. And that's what I would do. I would change it more to a perception of How do we gain the trust of the public? Mm -hmm. Because that's who we're there to serve and protect. Do you really think that there is a racial divide in the United States? I mean, not only with with African Americans, but with other people, and you know, with the alleged crisis in immigration. How do modern day police officers deal with this? Where some cities are sanctuaries, other cities aren't, and yet they don't enforce federal jurisdiction laws. Man, how do how do you guys handle this? So we we try to handle everything the best we can. Of course, we're human, so we mm-hmm. make mistakes. But um, do I think there's a racial divide? Yes, there there is some um, racial tension and racial hate. Um, but I don't think that's the majority of it. I think the majority of our problem in law enforcement is a socioeconomic bias. So we police and treat poor people differently than we do the middle class and the upper class. And that is what needs to change. I can't see that. Uh, After my, you know, after being on the other side of the badge wearing it, I can honestly say that I was never made aware of that problem or it never presented itself to me. And, you know, I, I, we were in Quebec, it was English and French. You were Canadian. Bang. Mm -hmm. There was none of this racial tension except going back into the early ages, uh, early 60s, when they had the FLQ crisis. And uh, the government at the time wanted to separate from Canada. The prime minister said no, and and the the premier and the powers to be said, oh, yes. And the prime minister said, yeah, welcome the army to Quebec. Went under federal martial law. That uh, didn't last very long, and everybody's living happily ever after. But I... you look at these different cities in the United States that are sanctuary cities. How do they get away with that? You know, aren't you all one country? 
we are one country, but we're also a country made up of immigrants. That's how we were founded. Hey, listen, we were I, a melting pot. I've got nothing against immigrants as long as they come into the country legally. But I, I agree. But when you've got these people who do not come into the country legally, and just because they're willing to work for less money than the American person who is either born or into the country legally, you know, certain cities, certain institutions close their eyes because they need the workers. Is You know, that doesn't make sense to me. So the real problem we have is the DACA issue where these kids are now educated, they're working, mm -hmm. and they could actually um, – contribute to our country, but they don't have citizenship even though they've lived here their whole life. So the question is then what do you do with them? Mm -hmm. Because they know no other country. And well, that is one of the complex issues we're facing right now. If they're in the country illegally, and I don't are these are these people who are dreamers, are they in the country illegally? And they don't have citizenship. So are they in the country legally? Yes, of no fault of their own. So they're legally in the country? They're in the country. Right. But are, they're not citizens. No, listen to my question. Yeah. Are they legally entitled to be in the country? That would depend on who you ask. I'm asking you and as a law enforcement officer. It would depend on the individual person and if they applied for residency and if they're a temporary resident, a permanent resident, or if they're on some sort of path to citizenship. But which the, the, once again, mm -hmm. if the person is not, has not got their green card or has not been, uh, become a citizen of the United States. Mm -hmm. And they've been here and been there for let's say ten, fifteen, twenty years. Yep. Are they legally in the United States? No, they're not. So there's the answer. The law is written. They're illegal. Deport them. What is so difficult about that? So where do you do deport them to? Wherever they're like if their parents come from Mexico? Bang, back to Mexico. If their parents are from Guatemala, bang to Guatemala. If they're from Montreal, Quebec, you send them back to Montreal, Quebec. But you, you, can't, you can't manipulate a law in order to appease society without changing it first. You know, that's like putting the horse in front of the cart and wondering why you're getting nowhere. As so a, the, as, as the as advantage a I have mm -hmm. of being a sheriff's deputy is I didn't have to worry about um, deportations. But and you're a law enforcement officer. You that, are there to enforce the law, whether it's federal, whether it's state, or whether it's municipal. Am I right or wrong? No, I could not deport anybody. So if only, you found only somebody, federal ICE agents can do. So that. if you found somebody who was illegal, illegally in your jurisdiction, you knew they were illegally in your jurisdiction. You would not detain them until ICE came. No, not unless they broke a law. But they broke a law. They're in the United States illegally. Yes, but I have to have a reason to contact them, and I can't just pick up people and detain them for the purpose of deportation. But, That's not how it works. In fact, our jails and states are fighting with the federal government because the federal government cannot get to the people quick enough uh -huh. in the jails when they're set to be released yeah. because we can't hold them over a time frame where ICE is saying you need to hold them. It's like we can't. Otherwise, we're violating – the law ourselves. You can't detain even though the person is illegally in the country and ICE has said, we are coming, we just can't get there right away. Oh, no. So um, ICE, would ha ICE would then be notified once they're in custody. We have to have a reason to put them in custody. They're illegally in the United States. Violation of the Immigration Act. That's breaking the law. Yeah, I'm not a federal officer. But... So does that mean you can pick and choose what federal laws you want to en enact and enforce? Okay, you want something even more complicated is our marijuana. Mm -hmm. And in the state of Colorado, it's legal. Yeah. So somebody can legally smoke marijuana, be under the influence of marijuana, and so one of those individuals gets arrested, yeah. and they've got marijuana in their pocket. Mm -hmm. The question then becomes, what do I do with it? 
because it can't be booked into their property at the jail because it's contraband. So it can't go into the jail system at all. So it gets booked into evidence yeah. as um, personal property. But the problem is evidence can't give it back to them because they'd be violating federal law on giving out that marijuana. I so it gets destroyed. This is where a one, you know, a one, two, three system works better than all these different jurisdictional laws that you guys have down there. I, it uh, becomes very complicated at times and frustrating at other times because you have two different paths to mm-hmm. a head-on collision sometimes. So how do you change it? Well, we have to put in a bill for it to become a law, and mm-hmm. then the law has to be changed and voted on and all that fun stuff. It takes time in the U.S. to ratify laws and amend uh, constitutions and change how things have been done for a long time. And, of course, there are many people with very deep pockets who who rally support for whichever team has the um, best motive to promote them, so to speak. And the poor cops, the poor sheriffs, and the other agents are stuck smack dab in the middle. Oh, well. Yeah, another thing I like to uh, quote Albert Einstein on is, we can't solve problems by the same kind of thinking we used when we created them. And so we need to change our approach and mm-hmm. change our direction to get to a better solution. So I, I just banging our head against the wall. I agree. And the problem is that these laws that are being executed these days and enforced these days were passed many years ago when nobody had the foresight to take into account what would happen if. What happens if? And that's where I see our problems are emanating from. A big issue with that is our social media and the crimes committed on social media where we don't have laws in place to govern Mm -hmm. social media. And then it becomes whose jurisdiction is it? And so we're having to rapidly write laws to cover um, domestic issues via social media and address issues with our juveniles right. um, who are breaking the law via social media. Hey, Darren, we've got to say so long for tonight. I want to thank you for joining us in Dexo Nation. If you'd like more information on our guest this hour, Darren Spencer, visit him, humanepolicing.com. Man alive. You broke the law. I know you broke the law. You're in the country illegally. But you know what? I'm not going to do a damn thing about it. Why? It's not my problem. I'm not a federal law enforcement agent. I'm a sheriff. I'm a patrolman. It's not my job. My God, no wonder things are so screwy. I'll be back on the other side of this break. Don't go away. 